I'm a congenital bilateral above the elbow amputee with two fingers on each hand. Um, so guys, um, so this is, I just, I just remember these trees behind me and um, yeah, I mean, I was, asleep, I was asleep on the back seat, so I don't remember too much, but what I do remember is this bunch of trees and the, the car kind of veered across here and into this bank, embankment. And this bank was a lot higher. I mean, we are talking 40 years ago. I just remember waking up looking at the road like this. Here I am, 40 years later standing in the same place that I did as a young boy. I've got a photograph of me right here. And little did we know that shortly after that photograph was taken, my family would be involved in a serious motor vehicle accident not far from here. My mother nearly lost her leg and was left disabled. And despite her disability as the sole breadwinner, my mother always made sure I was looked after. She instilled in me a deep respect for women and for those with disabilities who choose to overcome and overlook that disability, to rather let that propel them in life. Today, my guest is Liv Stone, a two times world adaptive surfing champion, and I'm super excited to speak to her. Liv Stone, it's such an honor and a privilege to have you on Shredding the Nara with me. Thank you so much for agreeing to this. Um, I must say I caught sight of you on Surfline and also heard of you through a mutual friend and Anne Smythe here in South Africa. And yeah, I just cannot thank you enough for, for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that Surfline video was so bad and it like, it went viral. So it's so cool to see and yeah i mean the shots are great too and it was like so clear and it captured my surfing perfectly oh, that's amazing i've i've actually been doing some research and some digging around and i'm quite astounded uh, you've only been surfing for about three years is that correct yeah i haven't been surfing very long compared to like these groms that start when they're like five or six years old get pushed in by their parents but you know i started when i was 16 15 so yeah, I'm a little bit of a late start, but it's been a crazy journey so far and I'm loving every second of it. Well, I think it's in your blood. I mean, you're just a natural and your progression and trajectory in the last three years is just nothing short of mind blowing, to be fair. You also seem to be a super busy person at the moment. I saw that you were at Project Runway the other night. Do you mind telling us about that? Yeah, I just a couple of days ago, I feel like I'm so off my days because as soon as I got I'm um, done with the runway. I like crashed for like 24 hours. I was so tired because, you know, you're there all day, all day before getting, you know, fittings. But so it was for um, Runway of Dreams where they have disabled people, not just athletes. There are a lot of athletes, but disabled people in general, models, um, activists, all of the above. Um, modeling adaptive clothing so clothing that's easier to put on easier to take off easy for people in wheelchairs with prosthetics upper limb differences like me and so it was super cool like it blew up so crazy and like it was sold out and it was the best show they've ever had it was my second show with them and it was really cool to go downtown Hollywood and I'm more of like a at the beach San Diego surfer so it was definitely like a different crowd but I, I had so much fun, um, very different than surfing, but I really enjoyed it. Well, that's good. I think it's uh, key to find balance in life. And uh, judging by what I saw, it looks like you met some really cool and interesting people there, right? Yeah, so many uh, crazy, incredible people. And um, I met actually this, I want to give a shout out to Molly Burke. I think Bob Burke is her last name. She um, is a Instagram, TikTok influencer. And I like, seen her through Instagram and like she's so amazing she's completely blind and she does like her own makeup and her own everything and she's like a model so she was such an inspiration to me and she kind of took me under her wing and she called me little sis so it's super awesome and and I got to meet new people I got to see old friends and it was all around a really good weekend that's awesome uh, I also see that you do a little bit of work for Adidas yeah, that was actually the first time I've ever worked with them, but they were so nice. And I, they actually came 
to the runway show. So I got to meet some people that worked for Adidas. Um, it's called like Adidas LA. So it's a branch of Adidas because Adidas is like, I mean, it's like Nike. It's absolutely one of the biggest athletic brands ever. And so it was Adidas LA and they really liked my story and it was really cool working with them. And I, we have some things in the work in the future. So yeah, just making really cool connections, honestly. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> your Your life seems to be quite a whirlwind at the moment. And you put out this like really cool, good vibe. And I just think the universe around you is just opening up all these wonderful opportunities because of your general happiness. And uh, I mean, it's a it's a pretty exciting time, right? Right. Yeah, it's so exciting. And I'm like, I, you know, Vogue interviewed me and I was like, oh my gosh, like that's next level stuff, Liv. Like you better be prepared. And it's like, it's so different because it's the same feeling like, when I won my world and stuff, it's like you're at on the top of the world and then like you can have that same feeling, but not in competition when you're walking down the runway. So it, it's so cool. It's like I have two really main aspects of my life and that's like modeling and fashion and then also just surfing and being a beach bum at the same time. So <laughs> Brilliant. yeah, I, I, I really like the dynamic and yeah, I, I'm slowly growing into it, um, you know, you know, I'm from Pennsylvania. So I, this is a whole new world out here with LA and Hollywood and surfing. So, yeah. So let's rewind a little bit. You say you're from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And for those of our listeners or audience who don't know where that is, I'm assuming that's a, a landlocked state, right? Yes. So it's on the East Coast. It's about, I think like 2,600 miles away from here. It's like you know the other side of the country and um i was mm -hmm. in a small i grew up in a small town called lancaster and um yeah it was five thousand people very different from hollywood you could go down a block and see like my whole town in hollywood but like so yep. i grew up there for 15 years of my life and all my friends all my family is there all my roots kind of are there. I still call it home because it is it was for so long um but i always grew up playing sports. My brothers played sports. So did my, my parents and my grandparents. So I was always involved in like that active lifestyle. And I played all different types of sports, but I really stuck to soccer for about 10 years playing that when I was younger. And then, um, everything kind of started to change when I found surfing with, uh, the Bethany Hamilton retreat, uh, three and a half or four, four or five years ago now because we moved three years ago. So five years ago now, um, I surfed with her, loved it. And I, I saw this world out in California and I, I loved it so much. My two older brothers were in college and it was kind of like a good time to, I guess, make the move. And my parents and I moved out here. Now we only said it was going to be for like four or five months because it was like, kind of like a trial. I just, it was a good time. I was doing online school and I didn't have much going on. So we, we thought we'd test it out. And now we've been living here for three years and just bought a house and now like it's pretty permanent. And I, yeah, that's kind of like my journey from East to West and surfing brought me out here. That's so rad. And to be able to have that mentorship and tutelage from Bethany herself, you know, via her programs and, you know, the, the cool supportive uh, network that she's got in place for young up and coming kids is just phenomenal. So it's obviously um, made a huge impact on you and your decision to take your surfing career seriously and your your entire family moved to, to California. So, I mean, that's wild. Yeah. And like, I will say too, like, even though I did grow up in a small town, uh, landlocked basically, I would go to Jersey and the Carolinas and the coast for vacation. So I always had this connection with the ocean. But when, you know, the board was added to the mix, then it kind of all just clicked. But I always loved the water. I was on a swim team. So I, my, my parents always called me like a little mermaid because I was always in the water. And so it came as naturally as those things did, but through sport. And so, you know, when you had sport, which I was already a pretty good athlete, and then the water, it was just kind of like a no brainer. Yeah, look, I think you've taken to it like a, a mermaid to water. I mean, having <laughs> grown up landlocked and, well, I, I grew up landlocked as well. Well, not, not too far from the ocean, but it just seems to have come very naturally to you. And with your drive and your spirit and your, your outlook, it's, uh, 
it's sort of like a marriage made in heaven, really. And like, uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me here, but once you've made that deep connection with the ocean and its, it's life-giving powers and rejuvenative sort of uh, qualities, um, it's, it's a powerful thing. And uh, you can clearly see that that's what's happened here. So if you don't mind, t tell me about your connection with the ocean. And I mean, we as surfers, we always speak about, you know, only a surfer knows the feeling and that, but how has it personally impacted you? To what degree has it, um, well, changed your life? And if we could, uh, if we could look at that and just explain that to us, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, I was just talking to this uh, with a couple of people at the runway and I just love talking about the ocean, everything about it just makes me so, so incredibly happy and filled with joy. And I think it's because when you go out into the water, you surrender everything and you're equal. Like everyone is equal out there in the lineup, no matter if you've been surfing for 20 years or you're a newbie on a soft top, like everyone's there and we're all equal. The, the ocean doesn't choose favorites. A wave either, either comes to you or it doesn't. And I just feel like I, not that I don't have a disability, but that I'm like everyone else and that like, it doesn't even matter. And that the ocean is healing. And so like, even if I'm stressed out or sad about something or maybe feeling down about my limb difference because I look different and I deal with those things every day, I, I'm like, you know what? No, like, let's go for a surf session. Even if I don't catch good waves, I'm still out in the water, in the ocean, feeling like the wind on my face and like you know i always say a good a good day in the water is better than not a day in the water or if that makes sense but like i'd <laughs> i'd yes, rather go and surf like blown out like one foot than not get in the water yep a bad day in the water is better than no day in the water yeah exactly because it's not actually a bad day. It's like what we perceive as bad because we're comparing it to other days of good surf. But when you get out the water, you're feeling so much better, right? Yeah, I know. And some people, you know, I've been going to the same spots for a while now. And then you get to know the people there and they're like, oh, Liv, how are you doing? Like, are you catching some good waves? Like, it's super fun. And then sometimes I'm like, yeah, I've caught like one wave. I've seen everyone else catch waves. You know, you get kind of down, but you're like, you know what? And you say, and I always try and say, you know, a good, I, I'm having a good day because I'm in the water or, if, or if like, you know, you, you chat with people out there and they're like, gosh, it's so windy. Like the report said two miles per hour. And I'm like, yeah, but, <laughs> but it's a good day because we're in the water and you know, no matter what it's the ocean is healing for sure. Yeah. And that's the thing about surfing, right? It's, it's completely non-discriminatory. It's inclusive. It encourages everyone to get into the water. And that's why I think it's so beautiful and remarkable to see this, uh, surfing, this love for surfing, you know, moving into places like West Africa. And you've got these young kids learning to surf from really underprivileged communities and, all they need is a surfboard in the ocean. And, and as I say, everybody's getting involved. Um, it's, it's amazing and awesome to see. And now, so I suppose we got to ask this question, like growing up as a child, how difficult was it for you? Yeah. Um, I think the big question people ask me is, Oh, did, were you bullied? Because that bullying and having a disability go hand in hand. Right. And, um, I never really dealt with bullying because bullying is a pretty strong term and you know I grew mm -hmm. up with the same people all my life they they kind of knew like I'm live and this is my disability you know and like that's just kind of who I am so I with with mm -hmm. school and with my hometown of course I had questions and of course I had uncomfortable situations but I was never um bullied or anything but then you know, I started getting middle school, high school, when you start to, your image starts to really matter. But when you're younger, it's like, yeah. well, I'm just live. But then when I got older, I'm like, well, I also have a disability and I look different and I get treated different, not in a bullying way, but in a, in like a, I don't know, like boys may not think you're cute or girls may not want to hang out with you or just like social things like that. And, um, I've mm -hmm. so learned to 
go past that right now since I've moved out here. It's like that kind of social stuff doesn't even get to me anymore because I'm like, you know, that really doesn't matter anymore. You, you know, you think it does when you're in middle school and high school and those things are so important. But um, I, I don't let that stuff get to me anymore. And of course, the stuff that does get to me is like just people at a grocery store that stare or, you know, like every day I go out into the world knowing that someone's going to stare at me and it's just inevitable and I don't even notice it anymore. And so sometimes if I'm having a bad day, that just kind of tips me over the edge. But overall, obviously, like I said, if I have a bad day and I don't feel well, I go into the ocean, but I haven't had any, you know, bullying or crazy things growing up, but. Well, it sounds to me as if you grew up in a town where a lot of people cared about you. And that's the flip side of growing up in a small town, right? It's, uh, there's much more of a support network. And uh, we've all heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And it sounds as if it was definitely the case with you. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it's, uh, it's when we move to a big city that people perceive us completely differently. And uh, you know, we just get treated completely differently. But you've been brought up in a town whereby your parents, their peers, as I said, there's this support network. And, you know, the result of that is that you've grown up into a fine young lady with a lot of drive, a lot of motivation and uh, just general positivity, which is great. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it it uh, it definitely translates into who you are as a human. Uh, your general outlook, not letting your disability hold you back, but if anything, propelling you even further forward uh, in not only surfing but in in all walks of life. Because you enjoy fashion, you enjoy surfing. I dare say you do some other sports. But this dovetails nicely with uh, the fact that you're not just a surfer, but you're a two times adaptive world surf champion. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So 2020 and then 2021. So we had the competition. When I first won Worlds, it was right before COVID hit, like literally the weekend before. The next day, like the world shut down. Like I won my world title, world shut down. So it was kind of crazy I was able to compete. Um that was a really, really crazy cool experience. I, I didn't go into that com that competition thinking I'm going to take a world title. Uh, I just kind of like have been. I start to get in this rhythm and this good headspace. And next thing I know, like I'm on the podium and I'm like, man, this is pretty rad. And then I, I knew that I was capable then. And then I trained really hard and I knew the competition was going to be in Pismo Beach, California. <laughs> so I trained accordingly got a heavy wetsuit because it was really, really cold. And uh, yeah, really trained my butt off and then took the second one just in December of this year. Um, so yeah, it was like definitely the best moments of my life for sure. Wow, that's amazing. The timing couldn't have been more perfect. I mean, COVID shuts it down the very next day, but you just managed to get that win in the bag. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. So you got two world champs, four gold medals. Have I got my calculations correct? Yes, yes, yes. So what, what's next for Livestone? I mean, you've you've achieved a lot. Um, I would say taking it day by day, surfing as much as I can, continuing to love this sport. Because if I, I if I put competitions at the forefront of surfing, I can lose my passion for it. If I like get too narrow minded on competing and being the best all the time, then it takes away from that day to day surfing routine. And but also like I do still want to like compete and still want to win another world title um, next year, as well as big goals would be going to the Paralympics in 2028. Surfing will be in the hopefully we're Paralympic hopeful for 2028. Um, so I hope to be there and it's in L.A. So it's close to home. And well, I mean, I kind of wish it was somewhere exotic. <laughs> it's going to be like Huntington. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's in your backyard, so it's pretty much in the bag, hey, Liv? <laughs> Hopefully. You're going to have uh, loads of home support, which is always cool at a home break, right? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're going to write a book someday, right? I mean, you have to. Write a book? I actually was thinking about that. I'm not much of a like an amazing writer, but I was thinking of having someone help me write a book because not even just like a chapter book or like an, 
uh, like an autobiography. I'd want to like do it where um, I know Bethany Hamilton does Hamilton does a couple of these, but interactive books where like you can write in it and there's some inspirational quotes or you can draw or or how can um, how can I inspire like the next generation more? Yeah, look, I think it's a great idea. There's so many programs out there that you can just download and you just literally talk into your mobile and it transcribes it for you and then you just get somebody out there to just clean it up and turn it into a book but uh, you, you've got a story that needs telling and I think it would be a, a huge motivator for a lot of a lot of people and yeah I mean the reason you should do it is because of the fact that you can inspire so many people and I keep banging on about this but it's the very reason why I wanted to talk to you because I found you hugely motivating and hugely inspiring. Yeah, and I think, uh, and I just have to thank you because I think our South African audience are going to be hugely appreciative uh, of you coming on and just seeing someone like you so motivated uh, besides your physical disabilities. Um, and I think we've now come to this conclusion that just get in the ocean, right? Because we've all got some sort of a disability. It might be a psychological, mental disability. It might be you come from an underprivileged background or there's something. So essentially we've all got some sort of a disability, but do we use that disability to, to get us down or to push us forward? Just get in the ocean because <laughs> once you've made that connect, um, that's when you start to, to realize it instills so much self-confidence uh, and wipes away so many insecurities. Um, I think you'd agree on that. Yeah, a hundred percent. Not everyone's struggles in life are, as a parent as mine, like, obviously you look at me and you're like, yeah, she struggles, like obviously with her hands. Cause that's obvious. You can see that. Yeah. But a lot of people struggle with mental health, with just even self image with mm -hmm. like, you know, girls, young girls compare themselves so much in today's society of, you know, Oh, I'm too heavy. I'm too skinny. I'm too tall. I'm too short. And it's like, I try and share the message of, no, you are like beautifully and wonderfully made in God's image. And like, that is who you are. And you should embrace that and not compare yourself to others. And that can happen mm -hmm. a lot too. And then I feel like, especially in the surf world too, because surfing kind of like paints this picture in people's mind that don't know surfing of like a perfect, like, um, bleach blonde, tan skin, tall surfer girl, which is like a lot of the community for sure. But it's also more than that. We have adaptive surfers. You know, when you think of surfing, when, you know, people from Pennsylvania, where I grew up, I didn't think of surfing as, oh, you could lay down and surf. You could kneel and surf. You can be a blind surfer. And I want to change that like stigma of when you think of surfing, you also think of all the possibilities. Yeah. And, and I think you're right. We, you know, we born and thrust into this world uh, you know, we're all imperfect. And as we've already discussed, have some sort of a disability. But we now live in a world where perception says that, you know, you've got to have or be the best at this, you know, whether it's physicality or... And uh, it's, it's people's perception of us, which often creates our own insecurities, right? Right. But I've, I've always maintained that each and every one of us have an inner superpower. It's not only seeing the potential in ourselves, but in others and unlocking that superpower, right? It's like, it's like the illustration of a gold prospector. I mean, that gold prospector, he goes and he digs dirt and that's what he does. I mean, he's dealing mainly in dirt and he's shifting through dirt and he's looking for that one little nugget of gold. And that one nugget of gold is is all he cares about he's not cared about all the dirt but every single day he's got to get through a load of dirt to find that nugget of gold it's like that superpower we've got to we've got to bypass and look at all the the, the seeming negative and 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 imperfections of people and and even with ourselves and and focus on that nugget of gold or our superpower right yeah and it's how we perceive and talk about and think about people i mean who cares if you're slightly overweight and who cares if your one ear is slightly lower than the other, you know? Um, does it really matter that much uh, for, for us as people and for our sort of mutual respect of one another? And it's just looking around us and, as I say, breaking those barriers down and, and sort of we tend to demonize things that are just natural imperfections, you know, whether it's an addiction we're struggling with. Like, let's get rid of that and just... You know, I love you because 
this is what you're good at and I love you because you're amazing at this and you know and I think that's that's the beauty of of looking beyond our own and others disabilities <laughs> and, and that's what makes humans beautiful right it's diversity um, and inclusion and including everyone from all walks of life and you know wherever you come from underprivileged backgrounds um, you know as I say affluent backgrounds and, and just showing mutual respect for one another yeah 100 percent. i think everyone has their purpose in life and some people don't know it yet and i think that's okay you know my age i feel like it's always you know really encouraged and almost forced at times to know what you want to do and to like know your purpose right away and i i think it comes with time learning experience and you know tapping into what you love and taking off taking off with that and yeah i mean we have to agree it's not an easy journey for a lot of people but you know when you do find your path and cling to it and and really make a go of it you know and i mean give it your best shot like like you're doing exactly i mean no matter what other people think about it like in my hometown a lot of people were like mm, like of course they were pers- uh, like um supportive but like come on, they're like surfing. I don't know about that, you know? And I, not that I proved them wrong, but I was like, no, like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm sticking to my guns per se. And I, I'm, I'm just charging. And I think, I love that word. I've been using that word a lot for some reason, charging. It's like, you can say that in any context, like surfing, charging is like going on big waves, pushing your limits, but like you can charge in life too and pushing your limits. (laughs) And that's so true. That's exactly what you do, Liv. You just, uh, you grab life by the horns and you just charge. And I mean, it's, it's stellar to watch and to, to see. And just very briefly before we wrap this up, Liv, um, so I've noticed that you've got these paddles that you use to, to surf, right? Um, tell me, tell our audience a little bit about them. How did they come about? Because they seem to really help you get into waves and uh, yeah, they just really caught my eye and I'd, I'd love to know a little bit more about how and where you found them. Did you make them yourself? Yeah, um, I know. I swear everyone says something different, but they are um, technically, officially aquatic prosthetics. So I call them paddles or aquatic prosthetics. That's just the official version, but they are, um, I'm actually working with the company to get some more custom ones, but they're literally off of Amazon. My dad and I came up with it because I was surfing and I wasn't getting anywhere out there. I'm like, I can barely get into a wave. I, I need to think of something. And so we thought of like swimmer paddles that like you use when you're learning how to swim and they strap on and my dad and I ordered them, figured it out and it like was a game changer. And now I've surfed with them for three years and um, we kind of adapted them. We like put duct tape over the holes because with the holes too much water would go through and we just really adapted it to who, like to to how I could surf. Um, But we're going to fine tune that eventually. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome, Liv. Uh, it's it's really ingenious how you guys did that. Yeah, I, I honestly like I couldn't surf without them, and they float too, which is really nice because they fall off sometimes. And it, yeah, I gotta find them in like a ton of whitewash. <laughs> well, I suppose the coolest thing is that maybe maybe one day you'll get to come and surf Jay Bay here in South Africa. That'll be really really rad. Oh my gosh, yes, yeah, I've heard so much about it, my friend. Shannon Hughes, which she's a commentator. She lives there, I think. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but she commentates for the WSL. And uh, she she so encourages me to come over and I would love it. I just know it's a little bit sharky over there, but... <laughs> yeah, look, I, I don't live too far from Jay Bay, about two hours away. And uh, uh-huh. about three months ago, I also got buzzed by oh, a good gosh. 12 to 14 foot. <laughs> Dang. About a meter and a half away. Hey, it comes with the territory, right? But I've got to take uh, I've got to take comfort in knowing that, like, even though he was there and he was probably there for quite a while, he didn't uh, he didn't do anything, and it just tells a story about sharks, right? It's only when you don't see them that worry that worries you, you know. Where other people like because they always say, like, I'm sorry, I, I know you're gonna wrap this up, but it's important for the audience to know that. Just because you see a shark doesn't mean it's going to attack you. If you see it, that's a good sign. If you don't, and then it attacks you, you I mean, it's too late. Sharks will never give away their, like, where they are. So, Liv, it's been 
nothing short of an absolute pleasure to be able to chat to you. Thank you so very much for making time. And thank you to Michelle, your mother as well, for arranging and facilitating all this. It's been so insightful, so enlightening, motivational, inspirational. And it really connects to me because of, you know, my mother and the fact that uh, she brought me up essentially as a disabled person. And it's just that beautiful ability to look beyond that and and just remain positive and, and go more than even just remaining positive, but, you know, really reach out and 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 give life horns, basically. And, and that's exactly what you're doing. So thank you very much. For, for all of our audience, thank you for joining us on this episode of Shredding the Gnar. If you enjoyed this, please hit subscribe, hit like. Your support means so much to us. We can only carry on creating cool content if you support us in this way. Thanks to my sponsors, Brew Kombucha, Prior Eyewear, Roadmark SA, Seasick Threads, and not to forget Homes, who keep me fresh in my threads. To everyone, we look forward to the next episode. And to Liv, we say a massive, massive thank you. All the links down below. Give Liv some support, some love. Please follow her journey over and out for this episode of Shredding the Gnar.